Re um, revenue procedures are procedural. They're meant to explain when something needs to be filed, what form needs to be filed, what needs to be on the form, what are the interest rates that should be used, things like that. Very procedural. Usually revenue procedures, not very controversial. People usually take them as they are, say, okay, great. It's just trying to help out taxpayers, trying to give them more information, when things need to be done, how it needs to be done. Usually they're very helpful and we appreciate revenue procedures. Revenue rulings come out basically to help fill in the gaps between the code and the regs. And you might be thinking, oh my gosh, there are six books of regs and two books of code. How could there possibly be gaps? Huh, there are gaps and there are gray areas and ambiguities all over the place. That's why tax professionals get paid the big bucks, right? Because there's so much ambiguity out there. Reg rules come to help fill in the blanks, okay? So they um, usually happen when um, the IRS is seeing the same problem over and over again. So they want to issue some taxpayer guidance to help taxpayers understand how they would treat it. Um, <clears throat> revenue rulings do not have the level of authority um, that regulations do, but I can very much tell you that revenue rulings um, have a high precedential value. Whether you think that's right or wrong, revenue rulings are used a lot to understand what the law is. And part of that is because with tax, we don't really have a big body of case law out there. So we need something to help supplement, and that's what revenue rulings do. Also, revenue rulings come out when the IRS really disagrees with a court case. There's some ruling that came out and they don't like the conclusion, so they will issue a revenue ruling saying, you know what, we don't like this conclusion, and if these facts were presented to us, this is how we would find. <clears throat> revenue rulings are published in the Internal Revenue Bulletin. Okay, here's an example on slide 14 of the citation. So here we have Rev Rule 2015-9, okay? That means it's the ninth revenue ruling in 2015, okay? And we have 2015-21 Internal Revenue Bulletin 972. So this is the full citation, which means it appears on page 972 of the 21st issue of the Internal Revenue Bulletin in 2015. So that's how the site works for revenue rulings. As I mentioned in slide 15, revenue procedures are very similar to rev rules. They're just about procedure and the citations work exactly the same. They are found in the cumulative bulletins just like revenue rulings. Okay. The next category of administrative law that I want to talk about is letter rulings, okay? So we really have two different types of letter rulings. We have a private letter ruling and a determination letter. So I want to talk about a private letter ruling first. A private letter ruling is when a taxpayer asks for a tax blessing for a proposed transaction. So they give the, fact, the facts of their transaction to the IRS and say, IRS, please tell us how you would treat this transaction. PLRs are very expensive to get issued. Pretty much big four firms have the monopoly. Um, on PLRs just because of the expertise needed to write one. So you really see PLRs written in big four accounting firms, some big law firms, but I've heard even that's going away. Really big fours are the only people that write PLRs anymore. 
and they are very expensive. Um, so you're talking about a big transaction for a PLR to be requested. A couple years back, Yahoo requested a PLR for a um, tax-free spin that they wanted to do. And it hit the news because the IRS said, we are not going to allow this to be tax-free if it comes in front of us. Now, this is a proposed transaction, not a completed transaction, which is why taxpayers will spend so much money on getting this ruling. They want to know, they want their blessing ahead of time that they are okay to proceed. The IRS said, no, that's not tax-free. When the results of that PLR were released to the public, Yahoo's stock price plummeted. Okay? So, um, PLRs are really only used with big transactions, with big numbers, because they are so costly to obtain. PLRs are only binding on the taxpayer that requests it. Okay? However, because of the Freedom of Information Act, everybody can see PLRs. They are redacted, meaning we can't see the information of what taxpayer is requesting it or a lot of the facts of their transaction, but we can see the PLRs. Now, PLRs are not binding or law to other taxpayers, okay, but they can be cited as precedent to avoid penalties. Okay, the, last, the other type of private letter or letter ruling is a determination letter. Now, honestly, I probably wouldn't even mention this, but the book does. Determination letters are also requested, okay, by, um, by a taxpayer, but it relates to a completed transaction instead of a proposed transaction, and determination letters are not available to the public, okay? So you can't see the results of a determination letter, which is why I wouldn't really mention it as an administrative source of law, because the public can't rely on it. If they don't know that it's there, they can't rely on it. But you can, as a taxpayer, request a determination letter if you so desire, and the IRS will let you know how they want to treat your transaction. <clears throat> so if we look on slide 18, we have the citation for a PLR. Okay, so we say PLR, and it is 2015. That means it was issued in 2015. 03, which means it was issued in the third week. And the next one, this is the example, is 0110. So it was the 10th PLR issued in the third week of 2015. Okay. Um, some other types of administrative law that's out there. Um, we have treasury decisions, which are basically just announcements that says, okay, we're going to write some new regulations. Or we um, agree or disagree, it's called an acquiesce or a non-acquiesce with certain court decisions that come out. So these are treasury decisions or really just announcements that come out. Um, also, if you look at 21, slide 21, they cover some other um, IRS communications that come out. Some of the ones that are listed are general counsel memorandums. Um, these are issued internal to the IRS, but because of the Freedom of Information Act, we can see them, okay? Uh, some other things that are on there, um, news releases, etc. okay? Um, another thing that is mentioned here on slide 22, um, we have TANS, which are technical advice memorandum. These are from the IRS Commissioner to the Treasury of Tax Policy, okay? They relate to proposed regulations. And we also have what's called a field service advice memorandum, which are written by appeals officers, 
and they basically are kind of an internal notice to everybody else hey we're seeing these issues a lot and this is how we're treating them okay um, so that's how that works okay now we have talked about the administrative sources of tax law we are going to talk about the last branch of government, which is judicial sources of tax law. So judicial sources of tax law, tax law are, of course, the courts. Okay? <clears throat> so there are three, really four different courts that a taxpayer can go through. We have the tax court, okay? We have the court of federal claims. We have the federal circuit. Let's see what the book calls it. The US, the US district court. Okay. And these are the different courts that a taxpayer can go through. There are a couple other that I will mention. Okay. This one is the small cases division. This is part of the tax court, but you cannot appeal to the tax court if you don't like your decision. This is kind of like a tax version of a small claims court. The amount at issue has to be less than $50,000. And like I said, you can't appeal it. Your decision is final. Now, if you decide to go into the tax court, one great benefit about the tax court is that the taxpayer does not actually have to pay their taxes to get into tax court. With the Court of Federal Claims and the District Court, the taxpayer has to pay their taxes first and then file for a refund to make a claim here or here. But with the tax court, the taxpayer doesn't actually have to do that. They do not have to pay their taxes first. Now, <clears throat> what happens, um, what happens when we appeal this? Now, let's say you don't like your result. I should have done this different than I did, so I'm going to mix these. We'll have our U.S. District Court here, and then our Claims Court here. Okay, so if you don't like your result in the Tax Court or the U.S. District Court, then you can appeal to the Appellate Circuit. This is the a Federal Appellate Circuit for whatever circuit the taxpayer is in. So there is a chart in the book. It is on page 214. It's exhibit 25. This shows the federal courts of appeals. So this um, basically has the different circuits. There are 12 circuits. Okay. So if the taxpayer um, is in Texas, for example, they are in the fifth circuit. So if they don't like your result from the tax court or the U.S. District Court, they would appeal to the Fifth Circuit of Appeals. Now, the Claims Court has their own appellate circuit. This is the Federal Court of Appeals, and they actually have their own appeals um, court. If you don't like the result here or here, your option is to appeal it to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now the U.S. Supreme Court does not have to take the case if they don't want it, okay? They have the option of taking the case and the U.S. Supreme Court does not actually take a lot of tax cases. Um, there is one other venue that a taxpayer could go through if they have a tax case and it's the bankruptcy court. To file a tax claim in bankruptcy court, the taxpayer has to actually be undergoing bankruptcy. That's why it's not really mentioned, because they have to have something other than tax problems going on to get in under bankruptcy court. So, 
There is something I would like to mention dealing with jurisdiction. It's called the Golson Rule. Now, with the tax court, before I get into this too much, with the tax court, it doesn't actually matter where a taxpayer is physically located. You file in tax court, and the tax court has 19 judges that travel around the country. And if you look on page 214, there's a concept summary 2-1, and it basically lays out the difference between the tax court, the district court, etc. I highly encourage you to study that for the exam, okay? So the tax court has 19 judges, and they travel around the country doesn't matter where the taxpayer is physically located, the tax court is the tax court. With the U.S. District Court, it matters because the taxpayer is going to file in the district court for whatever circuit they are in. If they're in Texas, they'll file in the Fifth Circuit. With the claims court, it doesn't matter where the taxpayer is. Again, this is just a federal court. And I don't think the claims court travels around. I think the claims court is only located in Washington, D.C. But I could be wrong about that. So, <clears throat> now, like the tax court, it doesn't matter where the taxpayer is located to file in court. But it does matter for purposes of precedent. You guys may not be familiar with what the word precedent means. It means what prior law out there governs. And when we're talking about prior law in the court system, we are talking about case law. Sometimes case law may be different in one circuit versus another. For example, the Ninth Circuit, which is the circuit that California is in, is known for having some crazy judicial outcomes in their court cases, okay? So depending upon what circuit you're in, there might be a different precedent or law out there created by the courts. Now, the Golson Rule states that even if a taxpayer files in tax court, the tax court must adhere to the law in the appellate circuit that the taxpayer is in, even if they disagree with the outcome. So there's an example given in the book. I can't remember what number it is, but we have two taxpayers. One is in the 10th circuit. One is in the 5th circuit. They both file in tax court. The 10th circuit and the 5th circuit have opposing views on this matter. The appellate court in the 5th circuit has ruled one way, and the appellate court in the 10th circuit has ruled the opposite. The same group of judges in the tax court has to find completely opposite for those two different taxpayers because of the circuit that they are located in. This has to do with precedent. The tax court is governed by the precedent in that taxpayer's circuit. Similarly, the U.S. District Court is governed by the circuit that the taxpayer is in, which makes sense because the taxpayer would file in the Fifth Circuit District Court, which is appealable to the Fifth Circuit Appellate Court. So that makes sense. What about the Claims Court? Now, the Claims Court does not have the Goldson Rule. Why is that? Because the claims court has their own appellate court that they appeal to. They don't care about any of this over here. Sometimes attorneys use that to their advantage. It's called forum shopping. It means if a taxpayer doesn't like the result that's in their appellate circuit, but the Court of Federal Claims has a rule on it, they will go through the Court of Federal Claims because the Court of Federal Claims doesn't have to adhere to the Golson Rule. They can do whatever they want, okay? So that's how it works. These courts down here, the book calls it, and it's true, these are trial courts. And this, these are appellate courts. Findings of fact are determined at the trial court level. 
okay? Whereas findings of law are done at the appellate court level, okay? So, look at citing court cases and again I really encourage you to look at slide 25 or concept summary 2 1 in your book it basically lays out the differences between the different courts one thing that's important to note and I didn't mention this the tax court only hears tax cases the district court hears all kinds of cases Criminal cases, civil cases, everything. So if you want a judge that's more versed in tax, okay, um, then you definitely want to go to the tax court. However, if you want a jury, your only option is the district court. That's the only place that a jury is available. Um, one other thing to note, with the tax court, there are two different kinds of decisions. We have a, mem a memorandum opinion and a regular opinion. These are the two different types of opinions in the tax court. Let's see, let me make sure. I actually always get these confused on which one is which. So I want to make sure I'm telling you the right thing. I know they're opposite of what I always think they are. what it is is a memorandum decision has more weight can't find it in the book but it's basically where all the judges sit and hear an issue so this is a full opinion okay and this is where um, everyone chimes in I hope I don't get this backwards whereas a regular opinion is um, is a lot less important, or it has a lot less, I should say, um, uh, precedential value. And I cannot find it in my notes. It's driving me crazy. Okay, so I want to talk about, um, oh shit, I got, sorry, I just found it on slide 28, okay? And this is in slide 28. It's, I don't think it's in the book, which is why I can't find it, okay? And of course, I got it backwards. Oh, I always get it backwards. So don't get it backwards, okay? Write it on your notes. So regular decisions involve novel issues, okay? Not previously discussed by the court. These have more authority, okay? Memorandum decisions have less authority and are more um, reoccurring. Okay, so reoccurring tax issues, whereas regular has more. Um, see, it's exactly opposite of what you think it would be, which is why I always get it wrong. <laughs> but write it down so you don't get it wrong. Okay, so let's talk about um, citing cases. So if you look at slide 30, it gives you some examples of citing cases. Specifically, these are citing tax court cases. So we have in this slide, we have Nick R. Hughes, which is the name of the taxpayer, and it's a tax court memorandum decision published as the 94th decision in 2009. That gives you an example of what it looks like. 
Um, and slide 31 has some examples of some citations of district court decisions. We have Turner versus U.S. Turner's the taxpayer. 93 AFTR 2D 2004 686. So, um, 2000, um, 2000, it would be the um, 90, there would be the second edition of the Atlantic Reporter, is how it is cited. Okay. So you can take a look at those. And that's pretty much it for this chapter. We've already talked to tax trees at the end of this chapter, but we've already talked about tax trees. There's not honestly a whole lot more to say about them. So that's pretty much it for this chapter. Sorry on the confusion on the tax court decisions. Please make sure you have it right in your notes and it is on the slides. Thank you. Bye.